Praise the Lord, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of Wednesday Night Time in the Word with Pastor William Whitfield. We are so elated that you've taken the time to watch us on social media. We thank you personally for taking time out of your busy day. As the word of the Lord is, it is like water to our very souls. Now, let us go into the word of the Lord with Pastor Whitfield. Praise the Lord, everyone. This is Pastor Whitfield thanking you for tuning in on this Wednesday, February 5th, 2014. As always, we like to thank the Lord for you, and we pray and trust that the word of the Lord is always a blessing unto you. We always know that you could take your time to do any other thing other than watch us on social media. So we are extremely appreciative both to both you and the Lord for directing your footsteps here. Today, as we go into the word of the Lord, I want to talk to you about something uh, that is a carryover from our message on this past Sunday. And not to talk about things that most people would shy away from. I, I don't do that. And when the Lord places something on my heart, I love to deal with it because I know the benefit that it would have in helping those that are so involved or so in the mindset of certain things. So today we're going to talk about overcoming the spirit of suicide. Again, overcoming the spirit of suicide. And many people have asked the question whether or not committing suicide is a sin because the Bible doesn't specifically state anything about suicide, but yet there are five biblical characters that actually either one committed suicide or two committed suicide, and there were several that actually contemplating contemplating it. And there were several other biblical characters that even during the at most adverse extreme situations actually cursed the very day that they were born. But if we were to look at this logically, the Bible really does address it, but it addresses it indirectly as to whether or not it's sin or not, because the Bible does state in the commandments that God gave to Moses that thou shalt not kill. We often think of killing when it's killing someone else, but even taking of our own lives is taking away something that we don't have the right to do, nor can we replace it. And when you look at death, it brings a person into a final state, and whether we like to talk about it or not, the Bible makes it very clear that it's appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. And the judgment is twofold, whether it leads to the judgment of the righteous that will go into eternal life and will have their abode with God, or the eternally condemned, which will be cast into hell and ultimately the lake of fire. And we and the church have gotten away from the biblical teachings of the realities of the afterlife. And not all of us, but some of us have. And we love to preach these flowery, flowery messages that have no substance and does not lead us into the realities of God. This book, this word of God does not change. God does not change. And he is still the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. The laws of our land may change, but God never changes. Yes, he is progressive as how he goes after seeking those that are lost and the things that he wishes to do in his church. But he still remains true and constant to his word. Now, today we're going to be talking about, again, overcoming the spirit of suicide in one character that we're going to be talking about in particular through the course of this lesson today is a king, the first king of Israel, Saul. And all of us may know the story of Saul and of Israel, that Israel uh, was unique to all nations. Instead of them having a monarchy or a democratic uh, society, they had a the 
a theolistical society or theocracy. In other words, God was their governing authority. And as a result of having the governing authority after Moses and after Joshua, there were judges that ruled Israel. And Deborah, Deborah was a woman who was a judge over Israel, one of the judges, and there were many different judges. Samson was a judge, and, and ironically, Samson, uh, at the end of his life, who had his eyes plucked out, stood between two pillars and asked God to restore his strength. And he killed a great deal of Philistines along with himself uh, at the end of his life. Uh, then you also have the very last judge of Israel, which is Samuel, which is the book that we all be in today. And Samuel was sent by God after the people cried out to God for a king. And Samuel thought the people had rejected him as prophet and God's mouthpiece because Samuel only did and only said what the Lord told him to do. He had a direct communication, a line of clear communication with God. But God had to remind or stated to Samuel that they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me and in, in them asking for a king. And God granted them their request and forewarned them of what a king would ultimately do. He would take their sons for his warriors. He would take their daughters for his uh, servants and, and utilize them for, for his own benefit as opposed to allowing them to live independently, that now they would become the servants of this king, and that this king had certain requirements of the people, but nonetheless, they begged God, and they wanted to be like the people around them. And if you follow the story of Samuel and Saul, actually leading up to the point that Saul is actually coronated as king, or installed as king, or anointed as king, he was still yet hiding, although he stood head and shoulders above the rest of his people, height-wise, and not just statue, but height-wise, that he still was not comfortable with becoming king. And notice that it took almost two to three years for Saul to actually start setting up servants in his kingdom to serve him. But nonetheless, as time progressed, Saul, who was anointed by God, would ultimately reject the ways of God, when God would give him instruction, explicit instruction to do certain things, Saul rejected God's word and did his own thing. Therefore, Saul was ultimately rejected as king over Israel. Now, let us go into the word of the Lord and we'll read uh, the scripture and we'll get back to where we are. So let's pray first. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus Christ for this day. We thank you for people who are struggling that are watching this message, who are struggling with the spirit of suicide, whether they're being bullied by classmates, whether they're under grave pressure because of a mistake or an error that they think that they cannot bounce back from, whether they have been the vicious victim of a crime or they've gone through a, a severe divorce or separation, or lost a loved one, and seemingly they cannot continue, or seemingly think that they cannot continue. I pray that at the end, by the end of this message, that they will gain a hope in you, because your word declares that you come, that we might have life, and have it more abundantly. We're not adding to the pressures to wanting to commit suicide. As a matter of fact, we rebuke that spirit right now in the name of Jesus Christ, and we add to the spirit of liveliness, of hopefulness, of joyfulness, of joy, and that mourning will be cast away from them perpetually, and they will never find themselves in a state such as this ever again. Because your word is sent to deliver them. And we stand to preach because the theme of this ministry is empowering people to be free by the word of God. And we stand by that wholeheartedly because you want the whole man to be saved 
and to be filled with your spirit and with the things of God and not the things of the enemy. So God, we thank you. In Jesus' great name we pray. Amen. Stay tuned as we wish to bless you with the word of God for your full deliverance. Remember, our ministry's theme is empowerment. Now, let us go back into the word of the Lord with Pastor Whitfield. So looking at 1 Samuel, the 31st chapter, and the 4th verse, and it reads as follows up until this point, what has transpired, God has rejected Saul, now an evil spirit from the Lord. And once you make that perfectly clear, whenever a person continuously rejects God and pursue things that are ungodlike and will not do God's will, Ultimately, God will reject him. Now, the thing that really led to this is because Saul had many opportunities to obey God, and he wanted to do his own thing. Now, understand, he did not want to follow God, and that's key. He made it perfectly clear by his actions. Unlike Sarah and Abraham, they still had a God-centeredness about what they wanted to do. And when they realized they were wrong, they made ways or made decisions to try to correct what they had done wrong, and they acknowledged their wrong. Unfortunately, Saul may have confessed from his mouth, but his heart, key here, was never fully engaged in the repenting process and now returning to obedience. God gave him multiple opportunities and chances. But then the evil spirit was sent to the point that now Saul sought a witch, the witch of Enzer, who now Samuel was dead by this time, to conjure up the dead spirit of Samuel. Samuel was alive, but he asked the question, why have you awakened me from my rest? Know this, that by the end of this day, you and your sons will be with me. Or in the place where your bones and your body decays in death, is what he's talking about. So let's pick up at verse 4. It says, so, and Saul said to his armor bearer, this is after the heat of the battle, Saul and his sons, let me set it up, are in battle. And Saul sees that his sons are been, have been slain, and now the enemies of Israel are, are Saul are pressing down on him. And Saul sees that there is no hope. He knows what's about to happen to him. So instead of allowing the enemies to kill him, what he wants is his armor bearer to kill him, and Saul, the armor bearer, refuses. So Saul takes up his own sword and runs himself through committing suicide. And Saul says to his armor bearer, draw your sword and run me through, or these uncircumcised fellows will come and run me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer was terrified and would not do it. So Saul took his own sword and fell upon it. And the thing is, Saul committed suicide when he realized his case was hopeless and he was surrounded by his enemies. He had no hope. And the thing about people who contemplate suicide, regardless of whether they've been bullied, they've gone through some devastating situation where they cannot see or think that they will bounce back from it, they become hopeless, extremely hopeless and helpless. Some of us, some people, have been even controlled by demonic spirits to cause or create or cause us to think about suicide. Some of us are or have suicidal tendencies, have not contemplated killing someone else, just our own selves because of a hopeless state that our minds are now locked into. We can't see that God has provided a way out. All we can see is the blackness of the hopelessness that infuses our minds and causes our thought processes 
only to think on a way out, a permanent way out. And most of us take think in terms of falling asleep or the sleep process that we go through nightly to the point that you will be free from suffering, that you will be free from troubles, that you will be free from everything that you see. The truth of the matter is, friends, that there is as furthest from the truth as it can possibly be. Because after this life, again, as I stated before, there are times that I wish that God would roll back the scroll of the heavens to allow us to peer into the unknown worlds that we might see exactly what would befall us if we take a certain fate or if we end up in a certain fate. But sometimes we don't put ourselves in that situation or God does not allow it because we have to walk by faith in the unknown of him. And the thing that really precipitated this message this evening, because, again, the, the thing that I talked about on Sunday, and even having an extensive conversation with someone on last evening who sees the hopelessness of their circumstances and cannot see beyond today or the moment that they're existing in and, and attempting and to encourage this person or persons that I've talked to in the past, that you must understand that Jesus Christ said he's come, that you might have life and have it more abundantly, that you must understand that the death process or thoughts of suicide does not come from God. Now, God may send a spirit to chastise us, but that spirit will never lead us into a suicidal thoughts or tendencies. Now Judas Iscariot, once he realized, the Bible said, that he had betrayed Jesus Christ, or as the word puts it, innocent blood. And when he tried to retract what he had done and took the money back to the priest of the temple and said, I have betrayed innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? Go ye your way. And he refused to take the money after having accepting it to betray Jesus. And they took that money because they could not put it back in the treasury. And they purchased a Paulus field. And that's where all condemned persons were buried, or criminal persons in mind, were buried. But the path towards suicide comes from Severe situations comes from things that you've lost hope in. It could come from persons who have rejected God and were grossly disobedient. They were never repenting, printful. It could come from things that have pressured you throughout the course of your life. And you see no brighter day. There is no light at the end of the tunnel. You have no way of bringing yourself out of it. And a lot of times people that are suicidal are bitter as well. They're unforgiving. They're emotional. They're locked into what transpired on yesterday. And not realizing that today and yesterday will soon be gone. And tomorrow, they don't know about the new mercies of God that are new every single morning. And they don't have a song in their heart that would get them out of the state and the mindset that they're in. And their thought process has become grossly fixated on this thought process. Some of them move to the point that they stop eating. They are no longer getting proper rest or nutrition. They're no longer socially interactive with people. They become reclusive. They have no friends. They become isolated and withdrawn. And they begin to do uh, things that most of us would consider to be bizarre in nature. Then they get to the point some people want to sleep all the time or take drugs all the time or they overdose on prescription drugs or narcotics or illegal substances. They drink themselves to death. They find things that they, they shouldn't do. I've had friends in the past 
who have committed suicide, run off of the road and run into trees because things did not go their way. And when they found out things and uh, have gone wrong and dealing with someone who they were in love with, and having been rejected by them or by the relationship ended, they lost hopelessness. Some of us, even as children, because our parents are no longer together or we're suffering at the hand of our siblings or we're going through abusive situations. Sometimes a woman in a marital situation feels locked in. Because of the abuse of a, of a significant other or a spouse. And they feel no way out. And some men who have lost their jobs and not in, all inclusive of just men. And seeing as though they're losing things and have lost their homes or lost significant incomes. Or they may have done something wrong and now they're in the legal system as a result. And they're too embarrassed to face what society's laws state for them. So they contemplate or even commit the act of suicide. Not realizing that even if you go through the penal system, that God can still forgive you. God can still have hope for you. Because hope does not disappoint. There is nothing that is that devastating that we can never recover from in life. And one of the major things about God is that he always tells us that there is a hope. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, that we might have a hope in him. He's come that we would experience life and wholeness and that we could break free from the prisons of sin and the prison of self-fault that indulges us against our will. Some of us have these suicidal thoughts that are against what we really want for our lives. We do have ambitions, you do have desires, and you do have aspirations. But for the moment, all these overwhelming circumstances have come in to cloud your better judgment and to cause you to think that this is the only way out. But the Bible also lets us know that when we are overwhelmed, the Bible says, lead us to the rock. That is higher than I move me to the stable one, the stable one, the unmovable one, the one that will never be shaken. Let me move to the one who is always consistent and persistent. These things that we go through, these light and momentary afflictions will never move him. He is the one that is so rooted and grounded in eternity. And he understands times and seasons. And he is able to even feel the pain and the agony of what you're going through. Don't think that we have a God that is so far removed from us. That he is not concerned about his people. Nor is he ever not touched by the infirmities, the weakness, the frailties of us, his people. But he is. Elijah, who was a prophet of God, a powerful man of God. When Jezebel was seeking to kill all the men of God, Elijah ran for his life and wanted to die. And he despaired of life. Truth of the matter is, he should have stayed put if he wanted to die, and she would have accommodated him. But he ran for his life to the point that he had stopped eating. And God spoke to him and gave him instructions on what to do and told him to go back and anoint certain people. God sent dirty ravens who are selfish and are ravenous beasts to bring food to him, to feed him. 
so that he might regain his strength and return and accomplish the will of God. Let me share this with you. Stay tuned. There's more blessings in the word to come. Seek freedom in the word of God. In the word of God, there's healing, there's solace, there's comfort, there's peace, and there is joy. Let us go back into the word of the Lord with Pastor. Many of you that are in a place that are contemplated because of severe loss, and other things that have gone awry. You have a purpose. And what the devil is attempting to do is to rob you of your God-given purpose. And if he can rob you of your God-given purpose, he can rob you of everything that is godly that is coming your way. He's robbing you of your joy. God has you want you to have joy and have it more abundantly. He wants you to have life to the full and to live life to the full and to enjoy life to the full. There are people that have said some negative, extremely negative things about me. And you know what? During the course of that conversation I said last night, those things that they have said don't matter. And I don't want to know what they are. Because I know that I'm on track to do the will of God. And you must be on the same set of principles when it comes to your mindset. The Bible said to guard your heart for out of the heart comes the issues of life. And those issues are things that are causing you pain, causing you agony. Hence the reason why you're in the mode or the process of thinking the way that you think. But I'm trying to get you to get unstuck to let you know before you pull that gun to your head, before you shoot yourself up with drugs, before you take that overdose, before you indulge in alcohol till you get alcohol poison, before you get behind the wheel of that car and turn that key to make that last ride into the deep abyss of death, never to return. Before you tie that hangman's noose and put it around your neck and kick that chair out from under you. Before you jump into that pool of water and never to breathe again to surface. Before you set fire to yourself. Whatever your methodology is to take your own life. Hear these words from the Lord. Hear what God has to say to you. Hear what he wants you to hear. Hear how he's going to change you. And hear how he's going to rebuke the spirit of death from off of your life. There's more to come from the word of the Lord. Stay with us so that you can be blessed by the word of the Lord. God has some more jewels for you in this word. Now let us return to pass the Whitfield in the word of the Lord. Hear what the Lord has to say to you from Jeremiah, the 29th chapter. He says, I will visit you. I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to the place where you were before in happiness and healthiness and centeredness on focusing on me. 
where they acknowledge joy and happiness in your heart and this disparity, this gross darkness, is removed from your life perpetually. And he says this in verse 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me. And I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And I will restore your fortunes. And gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which you were sent into exile. Exile is a place where you're far removed from the things of God. God has an expected plan for you in future. And you must believe beyond the shadow of a doubt that he does. And that what you're seeing now is just a delusion. A false reality. Trying to rob you of the preciousness of life. Trying to rob you from your greatness. In God or in the kingdom or in life. The enemy is after you to end it all. Because he knows if you were to survive. Listen to me clearly. That you would come into greatness. And that you will impact society or your circle. Or where you are in your life. Or with whom you will ultimately be around. That it would change their mindset. It would change the way that things are done. And you have a great idea in you, an ideology of God. And the testimony of what you came through. And the difficulties of your circumstances. And how you did not allow that evil spirit to overcome you. But you've gotten to the point that you're learning that this is a trick of the enemy. The Bible says this, and this has been in my heart all day long. It says, trust the Lord with all thine heart. And lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. And he shall direct thy paths. Not you. Not this evil thing. Some of us are feeling rejected. The Bible says, when my mother and my father forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. It tells us not to put our trust in the arm of flesh, for the arm of flesh will fail us every single time. Some trust in horses, some trust in chariots, but I choose to trust in the name of the Lord. And tonight, I pronounce... The name of the Lord over you. And whenever someone pronounces the name of the Lord over you, it is to pronounce protection. It is to pronounce peace. It is to pronounce supplies of your blessings, of your substance. And it's the complete eradication of every foe, every enemy. Everything that is unlike God to the point that even this pronouncement makes your enemies now your friends and your footstool. That's why Jesus said, God said unto Jesus, sit down here until I make thy enemies thy footstool. You will rest your feet from the weariness of your journey. On the thing that attempted to enslave you, to control you, to manipulate you, 
to gain the upper hand over you. The very thing that you, to try to end you. God said, you will master it to the point that now it must obey you. It will become your servant towards the work of greatness in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Suicide, you may have tried to control me, but now I'm going to use you to prove to the people of God that you are powerless. I'm going to choose every negative thing, every bullying situation, every hard thing that I've come through. Everything that you may have lost come through. And God has successfully brought you through. And now it will become your servant to say and to utilize that here it is, but here it goes. And now the power of it has been sucked out of it. Death, where is thy sting? Grave, where is thy victory? All of those things were swallowed up and defeated by Jesus Christ himself. That now death has no longer any mastery or control over us. It cannot hold us in its grasp anymore. Yes, we may die, but at the word of God we will be resurrected. Because those that die in God, when it's their time, they are still alive in him. And what the devil doesn't tell you is the trickery that he uses to cause you to think that if you end it, you will be in a peaceful place. I'm here to dispel that myth. If you want a peaceful place to abide in, you need to accept the name that is above every other name. The name who has all power. The name who has all authority. The name that every knee in heaven and earth shall bow and confess that he's Lord. The name that every demon must obey. And that name is the name of Jesus Christ, the only name that carries weight and authority. And all of us know people in the earth realm that have a name that is great. And when that name is pronounced or announced, or well, that person arrives, people show that person great respect. But there is a name that every king of the earth Every person that has ruled in a position of authority will bow its knee before him and declare that he is Lord unto the glory of God the Father. And that name, Jesus Christ said himself, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. Tonight, I'm lifting up to every person that is struggling with a suicidal spirit. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, that everyone that was bitten by a snake, the poison that was in them, if they looked up, they lived and received life, a second chance. I'm telling you, stop looking down into the abyss of suicide and look up to the life giver who is Jesus Christ. There is no other name given under uh, the heavens whereby men can be saved other than the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus' name is not outdated. It is not antiquated. It is not a name that is powerless, although we use it and it rolls off of our lips rather freely in disrespectful, unholy ways. But when we use the name of Jesus and we don't call upon his name in vain, but when we call upon his name, we're calling upon him because we need him to help us. 
Never be embarrassed. Never be ashamed. Never miss the opportunity. Even in your worst state, that's the best time to call upon the name of Jesus. Well, I can't see God because I'm in this state right now. The devil is a liar. Call on him while he may be found. Understand that the spirit of suicide is gross darkness. And Jesus is the light of the world. And we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father. When you're dealing with gross darkness, you want the brilliancy of his light to shine forth into your life. That is not a moment to hesitate. That is a moment to react and act on calling him. That is the time to call upon him. As a matter of fact, if you go through the scriptures in the book of Psalms, you'll find a lot of time that David and the psalm writers were in trouble. There were things that had befallen them. And if you listen to their wording, it tells you very clearly the circumstances that they were faced with. Some of those situations were leading to their demise. Some of them were leading to them being falsely accused. Some of them even led to the point that they were appropriately accused and had to take ownership of what they were done. But every situation just about that they were in had some hopeless connotations to it. It would have ended up with negative results. But instead of staying in the place of despair, and allowing their enemies or the enemy of their soul, Lucifer, to have the upper hand. They made one key decision that I want you to conclude and come to tonight. And that was to pray. To have a serious, intensive conversation with the Lord. Telling him everything that has been bothering you. Everything that is on the deep parts of your heart. Exposing to him everything that you can divulge and overcome and get out of your system. Nothing surprises God. Let me say it again. Nothing, absolutely nothing surprises God. When you come to the conclusion that this is not the way I want to go out. And when you seek God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, God can be found by you. Stay tuned, there's more to come from the Word of God. Don't be fooled. It is just a trick of the enemy to try to get you to take your life. You were made in the image of God. Love him and he will love you. Now let us return to the word of the Lord with Pastor Whitfield. Here's an example of what I'm talking about from the scripture. Psalms 22 verse 5 through 20. It reads... For the waves of death encompass me. The torrents of destruction assailed me. And the cords of Soel entangled me. And the snares of death confronted me. In other words, he was surrounded by death and destruction. And they were actually prevailing against him. And he goes on to say, the course of Soel, the grave or hell, encompassed me, entangled me, and the snares of death confronted me. In my distress, hear me out, I called upon the Lord. To my God I called, 
from his temple. Listen, he called upon God with his voice. He uttered words and prayed towards him. In other words, help me now, God. It's urgent. I'm not playing. I need you now. And that's how urgent you've got to make it to become in your spirit and in your soul, in your heart when you seek him. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God called, I called. From his temple, he heard my voice. And my cry came to his ears. Then the earth reeled and rocked. And the foundations of the heavens trembled and quaked because he was angry. Understand, God gets angry and, and righteous indignation. When you call upon him because something has troubled you, that he does not want to trouble you, such as the spirit of suicide, God gets angry when you call about call to him, not with you, but with the spirit of suicide and death and demonic spirits that are coming up against you. And when he hears that his son, his child, his creation is in trouble. He comes expediently regarding that. I remember as a father, something happened to one of my children and how upset that I came and how urgently the need to go to my child was and to help them. And if something was against them, what my heart intention was at the time, but I didn't have to go there. But that's how God reacts. He's going to defend his children and rescue them when they call upon him. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Glowing coals, coals flamed forth from him. He bowed the heavens and came down, thick darkness was under his feet. He rode on a chirp and flew. He was seen on the wings of the wind. He made darkness around him, his canopy. Thick clouds are gathering of water. Out of the brightness before him, coals of flames, fire flames forth. The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice. What you need is God to speak. On your behalf. And you must believe. That the words that I'm speaking to you. Are the words of the Lord. To deliver you. Empowering you to be free. By the word of the Lord. The Lord uttered. Thunder from heaven. And the most high uttered his voice. And he sent out arrows. And scattered them. Lightning. Notice he's sending out arrows. To scatter every from off of you. What you need are holy, anointed, godly arrows to defeat that spirit of suicide and death from off of you. Then the channels of the sea were seen, the foundations of the world were laid bare at the rebuke of the Lord. What you need, God, is to rebuke those spirits from off of you. If God rebukes them, they must flee. That means to severely chastise them. Whatever means is necessary. And he goes on to say, At the blast of the breath of his nostril, he sent from on high, he took me. Listen, he sent from on high. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. He rescued me. Me, from my strong enemies. The spirit of suicide is too strong for you to fight with and wrestle on your own. You need to find people that are godly, that will pray with you, that will seek God for you, so that he can rescue you. He rescued me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me. Understand the spirit of suicide and every demonic spirit hates you. They want to destroy you. 
but God wants to rescue you. For they were too mighty for me. Understand, it's too strong for you. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, troubles, despair. That's what the word calamity means. But the Lord was my support. Listen, he brought me out into a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. The Lord dealt with me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanliness of my hands. He rewarded me. Listen, he deals with us where we are in our righteousness towards it or his righteousness and the cleanliness of our hands. Don't despair if your hands are dirty, but he will deal with you where you are to get you to where he wants you to be. Only he can clean you up spiritually. That's why I hate the statement of people saying, I'm going to wait till I get myself together to come to church. If you could have gotten yourself together, you would have been together. And if you do get yourself together, then you're walking in your own righteousness. All of our righteousness are is as filthy rags. But God wants us to come into his righteousness by trusting in him completely. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his rules were before me, and from his statutes I did not turn aside. God wants you to know tonight that he is a delivering God. And you can be freed from the spirit of suicide. He stands ready to rescue you. And let me tell you this, all of his rescues are never disappointing, nor do they end in the demise of a person. But they always end with a great ending, how he spared, rescued, and set one on a path for eternal joy and peace in him. I need you to live. God needs you to live. You don't know if you will become the next great preacher, ambassador for Christ, the president of, you, of the United States, a great politician that will bring justice and righteousness to the office. You don't know if you're the great next doctor with a cure in your belly, in your mind, that will bring cures to some horrible and curable diseases. You don't know if you're the next great person to impact the next generation and generations to come. You may be the drum major of a great and mighty cause that no one else has the carriage to stand up in and say this is what should be done. You may be the one that brings peace to regions that are so war-torn. You may be the one to come up with a plan that ends poverty and sickness and a way to feed those that are hungry. You may find ways that God has anointed you to end crimes. You never know the greatness that is in your belly. Let me state this. God needs you to live. I need for you to survive. I need for you to become the great person that I see godliness in you. And you must not allow this spirit to take you out. I'm going to encourage you to pray. And this one thing further. That you will seek the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your might, and with all your soul for this purpose. That he would spare your life and rebuke this spirit. That you will find a house of worship where they believe in the word of God and deliverance by the word of God. That you will submit yourself to a man of God or woman that is led 
by the Spirit of God and that you would ask them to pray for you and that you would be honest and open with them and share where you are so that they can have the elders. The Bible said, he that is sick should call upon the elders of the church that they might, may lay hands on them and pray for them. If the Spirit is attacking you, that is a sin, sick thing that the enemy is trying to impose upon you. You need those that are holy, clean before God, consecrated before Him, that are living a life of prayer and godliness, that are infused with the power, the dutiness of God, the Holy Spirit that will pray for you and seek God for your deliverance and that they will minister to you, that they will give you the word of God and not their own thought process, that they will hear from heaven for on your behalf and only speak over you what God is saying to deliver you. That you develop a relationship with God and that you find a house of worship where you can become a member and rest there while God heals you. That every time that you're struggling that you will ask for prayer and they will avail themselves to pray for you, never tiring of you, never growing impatient with you. But letting you know, brother or sister, we love you. And we will see you through this dilemma because God's hand is upon your life. And he is holding us accountable for your blood and for your life. And because we love God and we love the things of God and we love what God loves and hate what God hates, we're going to stick with you. We're going to pray with you. We are going to become an extension of you and of your family. And we're going to love you until the gates of hell must release its grasp on you. If you wish for this ministry to pray for you, we can be reached. And our contact information will appear on the screen. Please don't hesitate to write us and send us your prayer requests. If you need to call us, call and leave a message and we will retrieve that message and then necessary, call you back and pray with you one-on-one. But we will lift you up before the face of the Father, asking him to send deliverance into your life. I will constantly repeat this, that we're here to empower people to be free by the word of the Lord, not thought processes of men, but by the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for each and every person that has heard this message today that is dealing with this spirit or knows someone in their family that is struggling with the spirit of suicide. God, we rebuke that horrible spirit. And we pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you would deliver them and set them free and give them a great and mighty testimony of how you delivered them and that the testimony will be used to deliver others. God, we cover them with the blood of Jesus Christ and we protect them by your spirit and we rebuke every thought processes that will cause them to constantly think on this evil way. Now God, bless them intensely and immensely in your spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you and be empowered by the word of the Lord unto you. Thank you for tuning in to this week's edition of Wednesday Night Time in the Word. Join us again on next week for another enlightened word from the Lord.